All right, welcome to Rex Corner. I've got Doug Brignoli back, and it's always good to have him. We find a million things to talk about. And it's a new year. I want to wish all of you a happy new year and a successful happy new year. year. And, I, and you know what? Look forward. Don't look behind. That's behind us. And you're not going to change what's already happened. Right. But you can change what's going to happen in the future. So Although you can use what happened in the past as reference. Or you can reference what it. What not to do again. <laughs> yeah, but don't dwell on it. I know people that dwell That's on the past. Dwelling. and All, yeah, the, all exactly. the good old days. The good old days. Well, you know what? Today's a good old day tomorrow. Yeah. So whatever you do today will reflect on tomorrow. And whatever you do tomorrow will reflect on the next day. You can plan your time. You can plan your future. But don't live in the future and don't live in the past. Live for the moment. Do what you got to do now and make it a success and you'll reap the benefits in another day. Right. Like today, I guess the lotto is the biggest. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not, I don't even pay attention to that. I don't either. Ina says, why don't you go buy some tickets? My mom used to say, you're such a lucky guy. Go buy a ticket. Maybe you'll win. I said, I don't know. I am a lucky guy. No. So this morning, Ina left and she says, look, I'll give you 10. You put in 10. Go buy tickets on the Powerball and um, the other one they have. And I said, okay. So I stopped at 7-Eleven. I got 10 numbers. I don't know. Maybe I'll win 50 bucks. Or more. Or more. Yeah. I'm not going to count on it, but it's kind of fun in a way. Yeah. So I was talking to Doug about something that uh, comes to mind, and I get a lot of comments on this as well. It's already established that the 70s was the golden era of bodybuilding, and before that we called it the silver era, silver era along with Steve Reeves and some of those guys. But what happened after that? The 80s, we had a whole other generation That's of That's my era. Yeah. So the 80s. Who, are, who are the people in that era that you remember that were some of the top guys? I know Rich Gaspari was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Kelman Scalic yeah. was, uh, you know, relatively big those days. Uh, and, you know, Samir Banut was mm -hmm. doing well, and Frank Zane was doing well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, those were my idols, you know. Do you think the training had changed from the past at that point? Do you think they were training differently? Because the gym had moved. It wasn't in goals. And it was, right. It's in a they new moved location. Over, they moved over to second. Yeah. Right. Um, you know... It's so interesting because the bodies look so different, don't they? I mean, yeah. like the bodies in the 80s were so hard. They were so striated. Um, the, the stomachs were so small. And yeah. then later, they were more vascular, mm -hmm. but less striated. They looked less hard. It's like almost, I can't tell if that's lean because the vascularity suggests it might be. But you don't see that same muscle hardness. Yeah, I've noticed that muscle too. Separation. Yeah, you don't see the separation, but you do see the veins. Yeah, and so, but it's not as, as nice a look, I think. No. It's, uh, you well, know. Was that more than 90s? Well, yeah. I mean, I think the 80s was the last of that super hard, super striding yeah. look. Then by the time the 90s rolled around, I think, you know, they were getting kind of like puffy. Who did we have in the 90s? I don't even remember at this point. You know, I, I, I kind of stopped paying attention, really, in the, in the 90s. I, I actually went to, I we left out of the country, I went to go live in Nicaragua for a couple of years. I left the whole bodybuilding scene and I went to go export mahogany. Mm -hmm. So I was really out of it for a while. It wasn't until, you know, I started, well, I didn't even start competing again. I competed once again in the year 2000 in the LA Championship and took first in my division. But uh, ever since the 80s passed, I stopped paying attention. All right, in 2000 then, you trained, did you train different than you did in the past? Uh, or are you just well, doing work for you? Well, let's put it this way. I mean, my training as people who know me and my writing and my, you know, about the biomechanics, you yeah. know, my bi biomechanics knowledge was evolving. Yeah. So, you know, it was more, it was better than it was in the 80s and not as good as it is today. Yeah. I mean, I've learned and learned and learned and learned. And I've also experimented and there's some things I, you know, thought I was on the right track on and then I said, no, this isn't working. But so, yes, it was different, but I can't look at, at, at bodybuilding as a whole and say, you know, this is what people are doing differently. I, yeah. I, I almost think the thing that has changed the physique the most has been the drugs. Yeah. Someone had said, in fact, I remember hearing this before, actually a couple of the doctors, like Mike Walzak back in those days and some of these guys, said, you don't have to train as hard when you're on this stuff. Don't worry about training and overtraining because the drugs will take care of it. Uh, I don't know if that's always the case. I mean, it kind of blows you up and, and makes you look like a balloon, but you still got to train. You still got to train the muscle. Well, yeah. You know, and every time you see a picture in Weeders Magazine of Franco and some of these guys, the things extremely heavy weights, even today, they're not training with those. Yeah. I go down to the gym, I don't see them lifting those weights. Right. They're doing a, a, a lighter weight with more reps, but it's usually for just the magazine. I'll tell you something else that's interesting too, is back in the in the 70s, you mm -hmm. know this firsthand, there was no such thing as cardio exercise. None, none. All right, so now everybody does cardio. That's yeah. just part of their, but are they more ripped? They're not necessarily more ripped than they were back then. I mean, Frank Zane was ripped. Right, uh, Samir Banut was ripped, uh, these guys, you know. And yet back in those days, I mean, the most ripped I ever was, was in 1982 when I competed for Mr. California. Yeah. And I didn't do any cardiovascular at all. 
But I did a lot of weight training. I know, um, and you guys might do this as well. Um, I see people in the gym getting ready for a show, and they'll put an hour or two hours of cardio in and say they're really getting ripped and it's just coming off. Okay, maybe it does to an extent because you're burning more calories than you're taking in, which makes sense. You know, if you burn more calories than you take in, you're going to lose fat, you're going to lose weight. And that's just how the Jenny Craig diet and those diets work if people want to lose weight, not muscle. They they eat so many calories a day as point system, and then they meet so many points, and then they burn more than they take in, so they end up losing weight, but they lose muscle too. You know, I think sometimes when we, when we look at exercise physiology, you look at something and it says, okay, well, you know, this looks good on paper. Yeah. But in the real world, sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. I mean, I do know that cardiovascular exercise um, affects different people different ways. If yeah. you're more of an endomorph, if you're yeah. a big bone guy, you're more apt to get fat loss from it than if you're an ectomorph. Yeah. If you're an ectomorph like me, my body starts figuring that out like that and mm -hmm. starts getting very fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. And before long, your heart rate is getting lower and lower and lower for the same intensity of cardio. Yeah, uh, that's right. So you realize my body's working against itself. All it wants to do is survive. It doesn't care about me being lean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I do the bike every morning for 20 minutes before I work out. I never used to do that ever at all. Well, I mean, it's great cardiovascular benefits. Too. That's the only yeah. reason I do it. Yeah. You know, I figure out my age, I got to go in, I got to have the circulation. I had been a little sick with this flu bug that's going around. I started feeling better, but let the circulate, get the blood moving, move around, and then I'll go do a workout where I used to do the bike after. Right. I want to warm up with it. Yeah. You know, I just no. It, it kind of gets you into the mood for weight training. Exactly. And it does get you know cardiovascular benefits and it raises your HDLs up, which pushes uh, pushes LDLs down. Well, while I wasn't feeling good, I thought, do I really, should I really work out and do I feel good enough to go? And I actually did. Um, I tried to stay home one day and it's like, oh my God, I was going to stir crazy. I just couldn't stay and yeah, sleep, sleep all right. day. So I'd go and I'd do my workout with minimum weight, three sets, no, four sets of three exercises, just feeling it out. And by that time I got done, I felt better. It just made me feel better that I did yeah. something. And yeah. then I'd go eat and go home and I'd just crash for about a few hours. Yeah. But you, you do need the rest in between. But just getting in the gym and doing something. Getting the good. blood circulating. Yeah. And you can do And someone said, what about cardio when, uh, with weights? I said, well, back then we could do a cardio weight workout by supersetting. Right. You know, you can do bicep, tricep, chest, back, and go back and forth nonstop. Boom, 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 boom. And you're basically getting a cardio weight workout where you don't need to do the bike or the treadmill. Well, and, and if your diet is very strict, your body's got to burn something, yes. right? So yeah. if, if you're working out hard, you're maintaining the muscle, something's right. got to give, right? right? So you're going to be burning some fat. But as you get older, we all know this, it doesn't burn it like it used to. Right. I mean, I can watch it, and I do. I went out New Year's Eve, which I don't normally do. We went to a very high-end restaurant in Beverly Hills, and I had chicken soup, which was really good. And then I had a shared a salad, a Caesar salad, and then I had uh, uh, scallops. That's a pretty decent meal. Yeah. And when it came no vegetables? To, uh, asparagus. Okay. And then when it came to uh, the dessert, she said, what do you want? I said, I don't really want a whole lot because it's already 11 o'clock at night. We want to stay till New Year. So we shared a key lime pie, a little piece. And the thing that got me, and I'm not going to give it up, was the sourdough bread that was fresh out of the oven. Oh, yeah, right. You cannot beat that sourdough bread in the soup and the butter and everything else. So there's my carbs. Yeah, right, right. But who cares on New Year's Eve, right? Well, it's one day a year. I mean, I, I would go so far as to say you can do that one day a week. Yes, you can. Um, I, I end up doing it even less frequently than one day a week. I end up doing it like once every two or three weeks. Yeah. Um, and for me, I think I might have told you that I had a, a, a blood test that surprised me where my triglycerides were high, my cholesterol was high. My HDL was low, my LDLs were high, and, and this is interesting because I hadn't changed my diet at all. Hmm. This was just, you know, your biochemistry changing as you get a little older mm -hmm. and realizing that your body isn't able to uh, deal with, yeah. you know. So now what I do, it's very actually interesting now. You know, 20 years ago I read The Zone. Yes. And, and 20 years ago, it sort of made sense, um, but I was more into the bodybuilding thing than I was into health, and so, uh, I sort of poo-pooed it, but now I'm rereading it and I'm saying, wow, a lot of this is, is actually true. And the biggest mistake from a cardiovascular standpoint, the biggest mistake is to eat low fat. Hmm. And it's so ironic because the American Heart Association has for the last 50 years told people to eat the food pyramid, which is this big thing at the very bottom, eat the most of bread, cereals, crackers, grains. It's like... These things are all high glycemic. These things all boost insulin production. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of fat, they would put the fat at the very top. The least amount you should have is fat, right? When you're eating an absence of fat, that carbohydrate gets sucked up into your bloodstream right away, boosts up your insulin production, if you're susceptible to that, which I apparently am now. 
Um, and so I went from 290 cholesterol to 159 really? cholesterol in four months. Just by that? By eliminating the rice and the potatoes and the bread and the pasta and eating three avocados a day plus coconut oil, plus olive oil, plus ghee. You know what ghee yeah, is? I've heard of ghee. No, ghee no. is basically made from butter. If it's from grass-fed cows, it's even better. They boil the butter and the milk solid, sink to the bottom, and most of the water evaporates. So you get this really rich cream right in the center. It turns out it's cardiovascular healthy. Jeez. So um, now more than ever, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, boy, what if I was doing this back then? Because I, you know, I'm still staying lean, yeah. even though I'm eating a, a significant amount of fat, but I'm not eating the starches and sugars. Well, that's known fact. I mean, we talked about this before. If you eat, if you yeah. keep your protein and fats high, carbs low, you're going to stay lean. And then when housewives and people that are normal families go to the market where they go for yogurt, so oh, look, it's low fat, honey, low fat this, low fat that, low fat that. Yeah, or zero fat. I said you don't want high that. High in sugar. I'd take low sugar yeah. or no sugar. Right. You know, or I buy ice cream. I want no sugar. I want the fats. Well, a lot of when when this whole fat free thing was have fat free intimates, fat free this, mm -hmm. fat free licorice, fat. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if it's like, if it, even if it was candy, if it was fat free, they thought, oh, this is healthy. It's like no. Well, what about the diabetic uh, diabetic foods that they have no sugar, but they're sugar free, but they taste good? Well, there are these things. I'm not exact. I'm not a biochemist, but I would say that there's you know, like I just I bought this Trader Joe's uh, fat free, excuse me, sugar free chocolate. Mm -hmm. And they use, I can't think of the chemical name right now, they use, I looked it up at the time, and it's a sweetener that is technically a, a, an alcohol, a sugar alcohol, um, that has zero calories, and in small quantities, it's perfectly healthy. Okay. Now, you, you, you know, you can, I forgot what, there's some rule, you know, that the FDA requires in terms of the labeling. But it's, it's effectively zero ca calories, zero sugar. It's effectively, in terms of what it does to your bloodstream. So you can, you can get by with that, it tastes good. Yeah, that sure that chocolate is great. As far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't eat a ton of chocolate, but I can eat four of those cubes every day and be fine. And drink a little bit of red wine, and be fine. Well, there you go. I've had a lot of you ask about Doug's book because he he brings it on the show when he can, and uh, so many people have said it should be worth twice the price because it's such a great book. And some people have sent me a second payment, of fifty yeah, dollars after they read it. Yeah, <laughs> there are people are really nice about that. But let's hold this up so people well, can see. There it is. Now I'd like to remind you. It is not in print form yet. So even though I'm holding a print version, it's only available as a PDF yeah. until about February. In February or so, maybe March at the latest, it'll be in print form. It'll be actually be published where it's got over 900 images in it. Yeah. And every one of those images have to be uh, looked at, scrutinized for both quality and copyright. High resolution, yeah. Yeah. And so um, that's what the delay has been. But um, the, the thing that is interesting about this book, that's unique about this book, is that where a lot of books will say, do this, do this, do this, do this. There isn't a book out there that explains the mechanics, the physics of why one exercise would be good or why one would be bad. Mm -hmm. And logically speaking, there's, there's, there's similarities, mechanical similarities between, between all the exercises that are good and all the ones that are bad, right? Certain, yeah. certain factors have to be in place in order for an exercise to be qualified as good, mm -hmm. right? So for example, one is that all muscles pull toward their origin. If I give you a rope and I tie it over there to some barrel and I say pull on that rope, you can't pull on that rope. You can't pull that barrel in any direction other than toward you. Exactly. You can't pull it over there or over there if it's right. just you pulling, right? right? Well, muscles are the same, right? right? So if you look at the highest muscle pectoral fiber on your on your sternum and you put your arm out here and you're sticking out, this person standing on the sternum is gonna pull this rope and it's gonna pull it right to it, right? Well, that is a flat press, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because our pectoral muscles are entirely below our arm line. There's no pectoral muscle above the arm line. So if you're doing an incline angle, you're moving toward your chin or toward your nose or toward your neck as if there's pectoral fiber there, but there isn't. So what do you, what do you actually work in front delt? Mostly front delt. Okay. Exactly. And it's not that great a movement for the joint. I mean, from an evolutionary standpoint, yeah. one of my endorsers of evolutionary biologist, and we were talking about this and you know, we can look at what humans had to do through the revolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And there were no incline benches in, 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 in the deserts or in the, in, the, in, in the woods. There's no reason for the human shoulder to have to do that on a regular basis through hundreds of thousands, millions of years, right? So it's not good for the shoulder joint. It's not good for the pectoral muscle. Um, and someone could say, well, what about the clavicular pectorals? Well, there's a picture in here. I have a person who's very, very ripped and she's doing this flat dumbbell press and you can totally see 
that the clavicular fiber, even higher than the sternal fibers, are working more than any other part of the chest. Because of being flat? Because once you put your arm up like this, the clavicle goes, it shifts up. Okay. And that goes straight across from here. Okay. So you pull, you're moving right toward the clavicle when you're lying on your back and you're going straight. So I always tell people, flats and varying degrees of decline are the best angles for the pecs. Amazing. Um, well, anyway, the, the reason I give you that example is because once you understand a principle, once you say all muscles pull toward their origin, or once you say opposite position loading, right, then a, a resistance has to be coming from directly opposite a muscle's fiber, muscle fiber origins, right. right? Once you understand the logic of that, then you say, oh, well then, this exercise, like if you do a shrug and you're rolling, well, no, only the muscles that are loaded on top opposite resistance are going to be loaded. You can roll back if you want, but it's not loaded. Yeah. Only the muscles that are opposite resistance right. will be loaded. Yeah, yeah. I, I never realized it that way, but you're right. And, and by the way, like a standard low pulley row, Yeah. okay, well, directly opposite resistance is your rear deltoid, mm -hmm. right? In order to get to your back, it's got to go over to the spine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well. You, you, there's no way that that resistance is opposite to you. What is opposite is, especially if it's unsupported by the chest, rear deltoids, teres major, which is right next to it, and lower back. Okay, so you're getting more lower back and more rear deltoids than you are trapezius or, you know, middle trapezius or lats. Actually, you can watch somebody in the gym doing that. If they have a tank top on, you'll see exactly where it's working. Yeah, you can actually see the rear deltoid, yeah. you know, but you can have, but see, most of us actually feel it. We actually know we're feeling it in the rear delta, yeah. and we don't question it because we figure it's our own little quirk. Right. In order to have the resistance be opposite the trape the middle trapezius, and by the way, the biggest muscle of the upper back, aside from the lats, is this big middle trapezius that comes down. Mm -hmm. Right. In order to have that resistance be opposite, that muscle has to come from this angle, from a forty-five degree angle on that one over there for that side. Right. Has to be. Oh, from I see what out, you're saying. From yeah. the outside in, because yeah. that's where the origins are. Yeah. Right? The origins aren't here. They're, they're here. Now, the other thing that's interesting is the trapezius doesn't connect to the arms. It starts in the spine, and it goes out to this shoulder blade, and it goes out to that shoulder right. blade. Right. And its only job is to pull the shoulders back. Your arms are just levers. So when you're doing rowing, yeah. when you're doing a low pulley row, next time you're in the gym, look at this. You'll say 90% at least of that person's movement is arms. And yet the muscle you're trying to target is even connected to the arms. That's so funny. Right? So there should be more emphasis yeah. on spinal contraction than there should be on arms. Yeah. But it's impossible to do that if the resistance is pulling you forward. If it's pulling you out, you can do that. But if it's pulling you forward, it's hard to do that. There's, no, there's no machine that pulls you out like that. It, they're not being made yet. Yeah. They're not being made yet. And this is what's frustrating is when I do my work at order to really dial it in, you have to know how to set it up. Mm -hmm. You go to the pulley, you raise these arms, you do this and this, you put this bench right here, and then you can do it. But, it, it, you know, it should be that the industry makes these things so you step into the machine, you sit on it. Yeah, that would be really nice. That would be a great idea to have yeah. some. Now, I'm not saying that low pulley row has no value, but I will say that it has very compromised value for the advanced bodybuilder. I will say that. Yeah. If you're just grandma, yeah. if you're just you know a fitness guy, okay, fine, you can do a little rowing, but it's not nearly as targeted as you think it is, and it's not nearly as good as a, for the lats as either a one arm pull in or even a pull down is. It's amazing. Good to know. But this explains it. This explains why, how, and I, I and I show experiments like the opposite position loading. I throw a rope over a branch, and I pull in a six o'clock direction on the branch, and I say this six o'clock pull is loading the 12 o'clock spot on the branch. Mm -hmm. If my muscle's at two o'clock, I gotta pull from eight o'clock. God, that makes perfect sense when you put it that way. Right? Yeah. It's opposite position loading. Yeah, if I wanna sense. load that two o'clock muscle or this 10 o'clock muscle, I gotta pull opposite the muscle. Yeah, so you're using a different muscle. Right. That's amazing, it's all in this book. And the other example I show that's very, very visual is, um, I show someone, someone took a picture of me from overhead as I was lying on my side, and I do this, Right, and I show how when the lever is falling that way, it loads the side deltoid. But when the lever falls this way, it loads the rear deltoid. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because opposite position loading. Whatever's opposite the resistance, when the resistance is pulling me this way, it loads the back. When it's pulling me this way, it loads the side. That's and it's so obvious. And it's so obvious once once it's depicted, once it's shown. Yeah. So that's why I say, look, the real value of this book is understanding why. That's what everyone needs to know is why, because then you can take this why knowledge and you can analyze any exercise you want. You can look at a squat or a sissy squat or a chin up or anything and say, based on these eight principles, 
here's good and here's bad. Sometimes they're all bad. Sometimes they're all good. Sometimes it's three and five. Sometimes it's two and well, six. Well, when you look around the gym, you see so many people doing things wrong. Yeah. They just haven't got a clue when they come in. And when a lot of people think that anything you do that's weird or different is probably going to be perceived as genius. Have you seen people do pull downs <laughs> and they'll take a pull down and they'll pull it down like this and they'll put it back up? Right. And I said, like, what are you working? I mean, it's not doing anything. Yeah. I can see. Well, again, you would explain. You would say, yeah. if you're working the lats, the lats don't pull on the forearm. They're only pulling on this bone. Right. So never mind what the forearm is doing. Okay. Only worry about what the upper arm is doing. Okay. Let's see where we can get the anyway, book. Anyway, to order the book, all you got to do is email me. dbfitness at aol.com. And I will send you instructions. Or I can just tell you right now, PayPal me $50 to dbfitness at aol.com. Make sure your email is in that PayPal thing, because otherwise I won't know where to send it. Right. And then I will send you through Dropbox, which is kind of like a consolidation thing. I'll send you a zip drive, a zip file, and it's you can download it and you can. Like, by the way, this is in color, uh, and the printed version will not be. The printed version will be in black and white. Yeah. So you do it through Dropbox? I do it through Dropbox. Yeah, it works pretty well. I mean, this here's an example of like you know what it looks like on the inside. Really, really beautiful arrows showing the muscles, what they're looking like exercise that explain range. See here I'm explaining the range of motion for the front deltoid is with the upper arm going back slightly so that you can get a front deltoid stretch but no higher than there mm -hmm. and why. So it, it explains everything you'd want to know that you know was mysterious to you before. I mean not everyone wants to know why by the way. I've had people tell me I don't know why I don't know why just tell me the what but I'm sorry that's, that's my nature. A lot of work. Thank you Doug. Thank you it's my pleasure I being here. I appreciate that and uh, there's a lot to know there and I've learned a lot just by sitting here with you. Has have a happy new year and thank you for watching and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Dot com. He, he is, is the equalizer, equalizer baby. baby. See you See next, next time. time.